All right, here we go. He is using a tree. It's time for some more Styropyro, specifically popping a 6,000 amp fuse. I guess he has to one-up Photon Induction's 5,000 amp fuse. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly show. Let's see. Some years back, the electricity legend Photonic Induction popped a 5,000 amp fuse. As far as I know- Okay, so yeah, he is referencing that. Nice. Uh, this is still the biggest fuse that's been popped on video. Well, uh, I'm gonna try popping a 6,000 amp fuse. And he's got all of these blocks of batteries in the background that are wired up. Oh boy. Now, 6,000 amp fuses, not unheard of within nuclear power plants. I mean, the main generator produces about 20 to 30,000 amps at about 25,000 volts. Now this thing's gonna be protected by big circuit breakers rather than fuses, but you can see fuses on the order of 6,000 amps in some of the auxiliary transformer feeds. That is to say, the main generator outputs to both the main and the aux transformers. The main transformer is what sends the power out to the grid and to the customers. The aux transformers are what it uses to power the house load. So power going two different directions. And again, you're going to be using, and again, the primaries are going to be circuit breakers, but backup fuses can be in the range from 2,000 to... 10,000 amps. So, large transformers. This monster weighs something like 45 pounds, and it's the biggest fuse that I could find online. Now, it's not often that I can beat photonic induction at anything, so I felt like this was a good use of my batteries. So, to give you a sense, I'm not surprised why this is going to be the first one of this size or of the similar order of magnitude to what photonic induction uses, because these are industrial fuses used for big transformers. You could also see a 6,000 amp fuse in the primary reactor coolant pump starters. And a reactor coolant pump is about the size of my house. And in most industrial applications, 400, 800 amps is still considered a big fuse. So this, this is a really big fuse. I say batteries because I'll be using my bank of 400 car batteries to pop this fuse. Wow. So, in nuclear engineering, at a power plant, we obsess about fault currents, that is to say, when a conductor accidentally shorts. So, seeing this many batteries set up this way... Instead of capacitors like photonic induction used, I can pull continuous currents of over 150,000 amps from this bank. So I... Just why? And of course, Styropyro would say, why not? Yeah, this is where bus bars would liquefy. This is an arc flash machine. Hope he's got his category four arc flash PPE for this. I think there'll be enough to pop the fuse. You'll be seeing a full video about these batteries on my main channel very soon. Ooh, that's exciting. This monster has silver plated copper contacts and has an impressive 200,000 amp interruption rating. Okay. That's one heck of a fuse. I'm gonna start with smaller fuses so yeah, 6,000 amps sustain. That is to say, 6,000 amps is its normal operating mode. At 200,000 amps, then yeah, this thing is going to open under an arc that's trying to weld those contacts together. So, yeah. To get a better idea of what to expect from the big one. In most other scenarios, a 500 amp fuse would seem pretty huge. Mm -hmm. But in this context, it's pretty tiny. What happens when I zap it with the batteries? I love this. I mean, it's, this is the electrical equivalent of doing shutdown rod testing and doing rod drops, which you're required to do before you bring a reactor up in power after an outage. The reactor is completely shut down during these rod tests, but you calculate the, you just simply calculate the rod worth, that is to say how much of, but Rod drop tests are pretty simple. You calculate how long it takes for the rods to fall into the reactor, and it's usually on the order of a couple of seconds. But the difference is this is going to go into the destructive testing category because putting a 500 amp fuse in hundreds of thousands of amps, it's not going to last very long. Ah, here we go. It popped. If you thought that was boring, well, it's designed to be boring. Yeah, 
designed to interrupt. And that is the goal of nuclear power plant operations. Boring is the goal. And I remember every electrical safety briefing that we've had, or really any safety briefing, whether it be electrical, industrial, or radiological, if anything exciting happens, then something went horribly wrong. Boring and routine is normal and generally desired at the nuclear plant. A fuse is supposed to break the circuit in the least exciting way possible. I cut yep. open the fuse to see what's inside. As you can see, it's filled with sand, which prevents it from getting spicy when it blows. Basically control rods for an electrical circuit. It absorbs the heat and smothers the arc, just like boron keeps a reactor shut down when you trip the reactor. Some of the sand actually melted to the fuse element there. Here I have a 1000 amp fuse, okay. and I'm actually going to cut it open first. That way we can at least see some sparks when it pops. This fuse looks to have parallel elements inside. All right. So basically the opposite of promoting safety. This would be the equivalent of at the nuclear plant, removing some shielding to get a better view of the cool glowy thingy. That's basically what he's doing here. And look, I know Styropyro is a professional who knows what he's doing, but yeah. <laughs> You're not going to see this sort of stuff happen at the nuclear plant. I hope this one is more exciting than the last one. Oh my. More of a visual. Green. Nothing to write home about, but that vivid green flash was pretty neat. And that would be plasma produced by the bits and pieces of whatever's in there. Or an arc flash event, which is what we routinely train on in electrical safety procedures within a nuclear plant. Those arc flashes can get really hot, hotter than the surface of the sun, which is why physical blast walls are placed around switch gear room. I can see the burn through there was a lot more a lot more complete compared to the last one. That's probably just because I got rid of all the sand inside. Yes, you got rid of that pesky shielding that's designed to prevent stuff like that from happening. <laughs> I refilled the fuse with India metal to see if anything cooler would happen when it zapped. Oh boy. <laughs> probably should have done the math on that one because the indium didn't melt at all, so I think there's just way too much uh, cross-sectional area of indium, but look at that. The magnetic force has actually bent those tabs there. Those are thick tabs. Oh, yeah. I didn't even think about that initially. Yes, the Lawrence force at 100,000 plus amps or whatever this is. Then, yeah, that, that's going to add up quick warping wires, the ripping of bus bars. So that was, uh, that's pretty silly. The slow-mo shows that the extreme currents may have magnetically ejected the fuse before the indium could melt. Regardless, I doubled up the cable feed. There you go. There's your safety feature. You eject something. <laughs> the fuse for to the avoid next shot melting. To play it safe. I mean, can you imagine that? So we're going to avoid reactor meltdowns by scuttling the reactor core out the equipment hatch. No. Ooh. Last testing. Wow. All right, there we go. Yeah, I don't think there is a drop of indium left in that fuse. That just completely exploded. That's really, really funny. Oh, and there's a bolt there that I did not put. I did not put that there. That just, of course, got magnetically sucked in. Oh, that's an FME event, a four material exclusion event, and that's one of the reasons before you do any electrical work or energize anything, you do a clean closeout inspection before you make the uh, circuit live. So, yeah. Gonna go ahead and throw in some arc flashes plus FME events. All right, that's a few different departments right there that would be performing uh, root cause analyses if this was an event that happened at a nuclear plant. As everything dies. And let's go take a look at the current. 120, 130, 130,000 amps. Okay, so well over 100,000 amps. That's fun. Not bad. The slow-mo on this one turned out awesome, even though the clamps barely held up for the shot. Most of the indium was ejected as it liquefied, oh, mainly man, via magnetic cool. forces at first. And then when the fuse finally popped, it made an impressive explosion. All right, now it's... That is a cool, I love that liquefaction shot. But yeah, 130,000 amps. That will absolutely blow apart transformer windings and create pressure waves. So there's arc flash, which is the uh, 
essentially the fire hazard, the burning bits, but then there's the arc blast, which is the actual shockwave, and both of these are trained on, because if they're large enough, they're both significant when you're dealing with significant amounts of energy here, and, and the sort of heat dissipated from this sort of thing uh, squares quadratically with current. That is to say, you double the current, the amount of heat dissipated is going up by a factor of four. And yeah, electrical grids can deliver that much fault current momentarily, and that's why switchyard breakers are rated on the order of tens to hundreds of amps. Hundreds. I don't think I've seen one above 150. That's 150,000 amps, excuse me. The sorts of things that sustain this sort of high current are things that are used in fusion reactors, whether they be magnetic confinement such as ITER, they can draw over 100,000 amps initially. Plus fusion pulse machines, the Z machines can also get that high. Of course, nothing is really sustained for that long in fusion as of yet. Time to pop the 6,000 amp fuse. Here we go. Now, of course, being a 6,000 amp fuse means that it's meant to conduct 6,000 amps without popping. So something like this car battery yeah. here, I mean, it could short this car battery all day and it's not going to pop. Yeah, if it pops, at 6,000 amps, a 6,000 amp fuse, then it wasn't a 6,000 amp fuse, then you should probably get your money back. I mean, it's going to kill the car battery first. So, this is where the 400 car batteries come in. So this is an interesting other way of looking at it. How many car batteries have to work together in parallel to break this fuse? Think of it as like a big team building event or something. How much current does it take to pop this thing? Well, that depends on the duration of the impulse. My 6,000 amp fuse is the top line on this curve here. So based on this, at 10,000 amps, the fuse will last about 17 minutes before popping. If you go up to 20,000 amps, it'll last about a little less than a minute. Oh uh, yes, just like looking at fuel temperature feedback curves. Everything has a performance curve, which is an important part of engineering. But yeah, higher cu currents shorten allowable time dramatically. And that is also one important thing to uh, calculate for your arc flash labels is, he mentioned time, so the time that it takes the fault to clear is a key parameter. But of course, I'm most interested in this end of the curve. At 100,000 amps, it'll only last 10 milliseconds. Now of course, the, uh, the actual peak current that this gets to before it pops is gonna depend on how my switch wants to behave. But regardless, this shouldn't be very hard for my batteries. In the interest of making more sparks, I opened it up and emptied out all the sand inside. Is he trying to create a self-sustaining plasma reaction? We I mean, just talked about fusion. This does change its fusing characteristics, but I would argue that due to the nature- Well, it's, I guess it's a different form of fusion. <laughs> it has nothing to do with nuclear fusion, but yeah. Closer to welding fusion. Nature ...of the continuous extreme DC currents I'll be feeding it, the fuse will now take an even higher impulse before breaking the circuit. The reason being is that without the sand, it's going to make some angry plasma. That's Similar to what photonic induction did. Hilarious, it's just a bunch of smaller fuses in parallel. Yeah, I mean, otherwise you'd have to create one really big long one, I guess. Like that all the way down, isn't it? Fuselets all the way down. It's the same design philosophy for having fuel assemblies in bundles rather than having each individual rodlet that's smaller than your pinky finger. Just put dozens of them in one really big bundle that weighs about a ton, at least that was about how much it weighed at the plant that I worked at. I'm not even gonna bother cleaning the contacts here because it'll melt straight through all that, you know, char and stuff on. Yeah, those contacts will not stand a chance. There. All right, there it is. Got all the cameras going. Here we go. Let's pop it. Oh Let's my. See. All right. I think I'm ready for this. I think I'm ready. I'm gonna get my slow mo camera set up here. Are all the cameras good? I think so. All right, here we go. So this reminds me of those experiments that you see in arc flash labs, which those are, I guess, another thing that could draw you in the hundreds of thousands of amps of current for causing arc flash events on purpose for safety training. The observers that remotely initiate this event are usually 
in another room that has quite a few layers of concrete between the art zone and where they are observing. He is using a tree. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. Jeez. I think I popped it. Wow. I can't wait to see what the, uh, what it pulled in the scope there. What? Oh, yeah. Big pulse. Big pulse there. Let's see. Oh, what happened? What? It's not dead. No, no it way. It survived? That was just the contacts? It, it melted the contact block. It didn't blow up the fuse. Hey, he just demonstrated, not sure if it was on purpose or not, the equivalent of a containment vessel staying intact, that being the actual fuse itself. And the contact block is what took it. So it's your classic weakest link failure mode. So the fuse did its job, which is amazing. That's crazy. What? It didn't pop it. What? Look at that. It melted the block first. And it ripped up that C-clamp. There's only... That's insane. I'll just... <laughs> the clamp is the critical component that cleared... That is amazing. I have to resituate that, because yeah, the fuse is completely intact. Wow. That is I was awesome. so confident that that was going to work in one shot, too. It's crazy. Sure. I remember it took a few attempts on the photonic induction video. I'll pin that one down below if you haven't seen my reaction to it. An iterative process, if you will. Going to use more clamps Enough. this time. The close-ups show that the fuse itself was completely untouched by this. The sparks were simply from the contacts below burning up and yeah. causing the C-clamps to give way as a result. Just like seeing something blow up at a power plant and then the containment vessel is there intact. I mean, it's designed to survive some things. That being said, I've never seen anything blow up at a power plant. But yes, big explosion and the critical component is still intact. Or just about every fight scene in Dragon Ball just to show how powerful the villain is. Okay, so I've, I've changed this side to spring clamps. That way it can like follow through as any variations uh, burn out there. So this is a design equivalent of, well, I was gonna say improving your core geometry, but considering this is gonna cause the thing to break at the center, I guess weakening the geometry, whatever. More energy is gonna be deposited at the thing that, at the place that he wants the energy to be deposited at. So yeah, let's let's give that another go. Dude, I can't, I can't believe that this is taking me two tries. This is silly. All right. I mean, it's better to try doing that versus trying to get up to 800 batteries. <laughs> Here we go. Was that it? Okay, yes. That was it's at the center. Popping. Okay, Thank yeah, I see the smoke. There we go. Okay. I'm surprised how clean of a burn through that was. It just completely vaporized those pieces. Yeah. It's in there. Kind of surprised, just considering the voltage I'm dealing with is low. But that, that definitely did it. That was a full... Po I mean, some of the higher energy systems that at least have the higher arc rating, the typical arc flash labels that say no safe PPE exists, are going to be on the low side of big transformers. There's just more energy of the potential arcs that could occur. The switch had a few hiccups there, but once it finally closed... The fuse pulled 150,000 amps. Wow. So that is why that was so violent there. Yeah, that is definitely toward the... Cata that is well within the catastrophic end of main generator arcs in nuclear plants. And these sort of arc events are the kind that can destroy switchgear, cause fires, and you have to fill out a lot of reporting paperwork for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Nice. The slow-mo shows that the fuse made an incredibly violent plasma jet oh, when it yeah, burned. look at the bits of melting coming out of that. I ended up refilling the fuse with metallic sodium. Really? So we're going to go ahead and put in a bunch of super reactive stuff to make it even... Okay. This is the equivalent of the Chernobyl control rods that had graphite tips to basically accelerate things on a device that is designed to slow things down. Okay. ...you to see what happened there. Well, I hope you enjoyed this little teaser, and stay tuned for the full battery video. Oh, I most certainly will. Thanks so much for the recommendation, and thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.